We thank God for such a beautiful atmosphere. Thank you, Lord. Because that matters more than anything. It matters more than the crowd. It matters more than the appearance. Nothing like just Jesus being in the atmosphere. And as I was sitting in my seat, I heard the Lord say to tell my people that although they are weary in the battle, that he has assigned a war room for the end of this battle. To go into your war room, go in there and pray, go in there declaring and decreeing. He said, you're not going in there begging, but you're going in there declaring and decreeing that the battle is already won. Amen? Amen. So don't grow weary in well-doing because the word of God says we shall reap if we faint not. So we cannot grow weary in well-doing. So I just thank God for another opportunity to come before you all. And I thank God for just this hour and just him releasing the words that he has for us. For him caring enough about us that he wants to make sure that we're emotionally, spiritually, and mentally whole. That's the kind of God we serve. You know, a lot of times we spend so much time trying to uh, work on the spiritual man, but it's all part. God wants a whole man whole and complete. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so uh, the, the theme for the next uh, four weeks is release from rejection. But today I want to talk about the beginning of rejection. Because I think a lot of times if we can just understand what happened, you know, that, that's the biggest problem with people that are dealing with rejection, that have been dealing with it since they were a little child or as young as they can remember. A lot of times we don't understand what took place. And so God wants us to understand that Whatever we had to go through and whatever we had to go face, it didn't start with just us. That this is a battle that's been going on ever since the beginning. Ever since Adam and Eve was in that garden, the battle has been going on. So a lot of times, you know, we look at that person who might have rejected us or that person who would have walked away from us or whatever happened and that person, we begin to get angry at that person. But getting angry at that person is not going to solve the problem. We got to get angry at the enemy who created this rejection to try to destroy the destiny of God's people. Amen? Yeah. So the definition of rejection, I'm going to give the definition again, is the act of not giving someone the love and attention they want and expect from another. Okay, also it is another definition says, it's the feeling that someone doesn't want or need you. So rejection is something that, it doesn't just cause emotional pain, but it can cause physical pain as well. Many have had to deal with physical pain as a, as a result of the rejection. Uh, many, have dealt, many have dealt with self-inflicted pain yeah. as a result of rejection. You know, many of our children even now are dealing with rejection. And so this is why this is so important that we get healed. Amen? Because I remember when God spoke to me way back when I was about 26 years old, 25 years old, and he told me, you know what, if you give your life to me and you and you serve me, the stuff you went through, your children won't have to go through. Amen? Because we'll be able to stand in the gap. So God wants us whole. God wants us complete. You know, the enemy will try to make us think that we got it all together. You know, I spoke at um, the conference and I talked a lot about David at the conference, which at some point David will come back up in the series. But the thing about David is, you know, David was used mightily by God. He was a man after God's own heart. You know, he was, he was the king. But David had issues, you know. But even with his issues, God used him. And so the enemy likes to try to make us think that because God is using us the way that he's using us, that that automatically means that we're whole or that we're delivered. But this still work. God will use us even while we're broken. Yeah. And we got to remember that. He'll use us while we're broken all the way up until he heals us. Because that's the kind of loving, compassionate God we serve. But what he don't want us to do is stop the healing process because we think we have arrived. 
or we stop the healing process because we're afraid of public embarrassment. God don't want those kind of things to stop us from being healed. Okay, in the word rejection is the word eject. Matter of fact, if you use the word reject instead of using rejection, it's only the letter R that stops from us from forming the letter eject from, from the word eject. Okay, to eject means to force or throw something out in a violent or sudden way. How many can identify with the definition of rejection? You know, feeling like you didn't belong, feeling like, you know, you didn't deserve what happened to you, feeling ejected even, thrown away, forgotten about. Okay, and we're not bringing that up today to just kind of hash up old memories and make you get angry at that person again. That's not the purpose of this. See, I, I was saying on last week that if I don't have a problem with, we'll use the roots in our mouth and our teeth. If, you, if, you, if that root ain't inflamed and you touch it, it won't do anything. But if the root is inflamed and, it, and we touch it, it's going to hurt. So why, the reason why we're going back to the beginning of things and the reason why we got to go back to the root of things because sometimes we think that the root's all right. But if on uh, tonight we touch it and it hurts, then we know that we need to heal. So that's our purpose for going back on, on tonight. Our purpose is not to try to bring you back to some old stuff. And I know what it is to block stuff out. I dealt with that on more than half of my life. You know, when I, by the time I reached 26 years old and God really began to deal with me and I began to um, go back through my life, there was things that I blocked out for years because I didn't want to deal with it. You know, and so, but the thing about it is you can never really function the way that you need to function and you definitely can't be the child of God that God really wants you to be, not as far as being able to go into your destiny until you deal with it. So if we're blocking things out, we want to deal with it out tonight. We want to let it go. We want to totally release it because God wants us healed. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk about the beginning of rejection. We want to go back all the way to the circumstances surrounding our birth and even before then. We've been trying to deal with rejection, but we've been dealing with rejection on a surface level. You know, what we don't want our brothers and our sisters to see. You know, but rejection is so much deeper than that. Because rejection is the root cause of things. Okay, and the root is that part of the plant that's underneath the dirt. You know, that's the part of the plant that gets covered. You can't see it. That plant might look beautiful and stuff on the, on the outside, but you can't see that root. But the only thing about that root being there, if it's not a good root, eventually it's going to kill the plant. Because the root is what provides the nourishment to that plant. You know, so that's why we serve the kind of God that when we come into him, he know we got problems. He know we got issues. You know, and God will keep on, he'll keep on working with us, you know, and even moving us forward and, and into the things of God because he loves us that much. But then it'll come a time, a point in time when he'll say, all right, now it's time for you to let me heal you. It's time that we deal with stuff. You know, he allows us to feel safe first in his arms because he knows all the stuff that we've been through when we was out there, you know, so he'll allow us to just get right up into his arms get into daddy's arms, and when we're, once we're in his arms, that's when he wants us to start dealing with some stuff. Because, you know, the thing about it is, he can't bring you, or me, completely to our destiny with this hurt inside of us. Because the, those that are rejected, become, they become the rejectors. If we don't let it go, we become guilty of the same thing that the person who rejected us was guilty of. Amen. And so God wants me to really break down on tonight about, you know, the womb and, and how this thing started. Because like I said, sometimes if we can just begin to understand, if we can begin to understand, you know, there was a lot of things that I held on to with my father until I became a parent and I began to understand. Until I got to the point where I began to be able to put myself in his place. And I began to realize that, look, you didn't do this thing perfect either. You know, but we want grace and mercy. And so we got to be willing to give grace and mercy to that person who was in our life who might not have 
get everything right. Amen. That's what God wants us to be able to do. So the root is the part of the plant that is under the dirt and provides the nourishment that produces the fruit. And see, so therefore, rejection is that root. And one of the biggest fruits it produces is rebellion. Rebel whenever, whenever you see rejection, you're always going to see rebellion. And that's why a lot of times when um, the, the title of my book that I, I'm going to write is When Rejection's in a Womb. A lot of times when, you, when the children come out you know, of that womb where they had to deal with rejection and they get to be a certain age, all of a sudden they become rebellious. You know, and we get so angry and so upset with them. But what we don't realize sometimes was that was what? That was the first emotion that they came in contact with. That was the first thing that attacked yourself. And in this case, we're talking about a spirit of rejection. Because that's what it is. It's a spirit of rejection. And I'm going to begin to explain the womb. When God began to give me the breakdown of the womb, I was like, man, I never even thought about that. So we're not seeing that although rejection is physical, or should I say can cause physical pain, that the main purpose of it is spiritual. Uh -huh. The main purpose of rejection is to destroy your spiritual identity, to cause you to die spiritually, to cause you not to become the person that God desires you to be, to cause you not to, you know, when rejection came in my life, it was so that I would stand up here uh, today. The devil didn't want to give me the opportunity to be able to stand up here uh, today and say to somebody that my God is a deliverer. That's why he started so early in my age. That's why he attacked me at such a young age because he did not want this day to come to pass. But the devil is a liar. That's the good thing on uh, today. That God wants to heal us of rejection. He wants to heal us of everywhere it hurts. He no longer wants to see his people walking around with, the, with all the fruits of rejection. Depression and loneliness and just feeling forsaken. Rebellion, hurt, anger, pride. All the different fruits that rejection breeds. But we can't get rid of it until we get rid of the root of rejection. Yeah. Yeah. We deal with the hurt. We'll deal with the pain. We deal with all of that and then we wonder why. Lord, it seems like I'm right back here again. Because there was a root that never came up. I talked about my grandson last week. You know how, how good it looks when the lawn guy comes and he cuts it all down. But the thing about it is we're not removing the roots of those wild plants and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So after a while, a few days later, it comes back up. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing in our lives. And this is why it seems like we're going in circles. Because we gotta get to the root of that thing. God wants to get to the root. If he can get to the root, he can change your life forever. He can change my life forever if we just let him get to the root. The enemy already knows from personal experience that you can't go but so far into the plans of God with rejection inside of you. Sooner or later, the symptoms are going to manifest. Uh -huh. Sooner or later, the, the symptoms will destroy us. And the enemy knows that himself because something got him kicked out of heaven. You know, pride formed somewhere in him, yep. and it got him kicked out of heaven. So he wasn't able to go into his destiny. So he's wise enough to know that if he can keep these stuck and stuff inside of us, that we too will destroy our destiny. And that's why he comes at us the way he comes at us. That's good. That's good. Right before we go to scripture, I want to share the revelation that God gave me regarding the womb. Not the womb where the child will physically exist at for nine months, but that spiritual womb. You know, and I want to go to scripture though as I begin uh, to explain the womb because I'm telling you the revelation that I got on this, I'm like, we, we only knew what we were fighting against. You know, because if we recognize, sometimes you just got to recognize what you're fighting against yeah. to win the battle. Uh -huh. You know, just like I said, when, um, when God just spoke and said, tell my people to go into their war rooms for the last part of the battle. That was instructions. Yeah. That was instructions. You know, so when you recognize what, what, what is really going on with you inside, what, what this battle is all about, when we go all the way back to the beginning of times and see that this ain't nothing new that the enemy's doing, that he keeps 
using the same tricks. And when we see why he battles the womb so much, then we can be able to win at this thing. We can be able to forgive and realize that this didn't start with them. This was a cycle. You know, and if I don't forgive, I become part of the cycle. And that's what God wants to avoid. So Genesis 2 and 21. Let's go to Genesis 2 and 21. I'm going to start with verse 21. We've got to go all the way back to the beginning of time. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. In verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a one man and brought her unto man. Verse 23 says, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. So if you study the word woman, that's two words put together. Womb and man. That's where it comes from. Two words. Womb and man. Okay? And so when you think about the fact that God took a woman, took a man rather, and he produced a woman outside of that, from, from that man. We, we have, like I said, a womb and a man. So therefore, when we think about the womb, we can't just think about the female. You know, but spiritually, that womb is both the male and the female yeah. because it came from the man. Yeah. Okay, so there was a connection that was made during that time. If you put it together, the word womb and man, you get woman. When God created woman, he put a womb inside of her. The womb is meant to be protected because out of it comes life. Okay, so we all walk around with a womb that is meant to be protected. And the reason why it has to be protected, because the enemy's main fight is that womb. And I'm going to bring you the scripture. Let's read Genesis 3 and 15. And it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy heel, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So basically, what God was saying is it was going to be a war going on in the womb. Because that's where the seed is planted. Am I right? Yeah. The seed is planted in the womb. And so from that day forward, there was going to be a war going on in the womb. And this is why the enemy comes and he sets up different devices. He sets up hurt. He sets up people, all this emotional stuff. And he sets it up in the womb in order to try to fight the light that will one day come into that womb. If we understood the war that takes place in the womb, we would understand why all wombs are not empty. You know, they say a man believes that wombs are empty up until conception. But spiritually, the womb is not empty. The womb is filled with whatever emotions and hurt and baggage that we have went through in life. It's, it's, filled, it's, it's filled with it. And it's sitting waiting for the day that we can see so that it can try to attach itself to our children. Yeah. yeah. The word enmity, because it said, and I will put enmity between thee and a woman, the word enmity means hostility, hate, friction, animosity. One translation says there will be a war. Even the idea of abortion that man came up with was Satan's plot to try to destroy the life that the womb produces. Yeah. That was part of the plan all the way back from the, from the garden because it was the serpent that, that he was talking to. He was letting the serpent know that he was going to put in between entity between him and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. So when we talk about rejection being in the womb, we got to realize that this fight did not start with our mother. It didn't start with our father and whoever else we wanted to blame. 
only thing they were guilty of was not being able to recognize the plot and the plan of the enemy. Yeah. And so many of us are not, we we're guilty of the same thing. Many of us don't realize either how devious the enemy is and how this plot that he put inside of our womb to try to destroy our child, to try to destroy our children. We, many of us are not aware of it either. So we can't be, and we can't be mad at somebody for what they did in us. Yeah, yeah, that's true. God has given a revelation in this hour that many did not have in the past. Many did not have the wisdom that they have, that we have now. Yeah. Okay, um, even the Satan awaits the opportunity to plant rejection in the womb of the woman. Because listen, he, had to, he saw how powerful the womb was when Jesus came through it. You know, he, he recognized then that it wasn't just a physical thing, but it was a spiritual thing. Yeah. Because the one who would destroy him, the one who would who would uh, um, be able, who would take away his power, God even allowed him to come through the natural womb. God allowed his son to come through the natural womb, but it was for a spiritual purpose. And from that day, the enemy knew that the womb was something that he would have to fight even harder. Uh huh. He knew he would have to fight even harder. So when our Savior Jesus Christ came through the womb of a woman, the one who was sent to destroy the enemy, the enemy realized that his plot had, was more than natural, but it was spiritual. If he didn't recognize it in the garden when Jesus spoke to him, excuse me, when God spoke to him, if he didn't realize it then, he recognized it at this time. He recognized that it was going to be a fight. And that the thing that he should go after the hardest is the womb. That's what he goes after the hardest. Oh, that's good. But when we recognize, when we recognize his plot, if we can recognize the plot of the enemy, yeah. you know, if we can recognize when this all began. Yeah. You know, and if, if, if we just see that it was one of Satan's devices, yeah. not to just destroy us, but to destroy our parents yeah. and to destroy our parents. Come on. This was part of the enemy's plan from the day that he came into that garden. The day that the serpent began to try to trick Eve and get Eve to think that she could eat out of the tree of life and become greater than God. The day that he did that, that's when this whole plot began. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to be aware of the enemy's devices. Amen. We got to be aware because his devices will destroy us if we're not aware of it. You know, we'll be praising God, trying to do everything right, but allowing rejection to remain inside of us, slowly killing us spiritually, slowly causing us to die to our destiny. And we don't want that to happen. Amen. Like I said, we're going all the way back in order to see. The plots of the enemy. All the way back. Because that's in order to go to the roots. You got to go all the way back. Yeah. All the way back. You know, when I, even when I was writing this book, I didn't come that far back. God gave me that revelation recently. You know, when I, when I, when I was writing the book, I, was, I went back to the very beginning from the time that of conception in our mother's womb. But then God spoke and said, no, you got to go further back than that. You got to let them see the beginning of this plot. Because the enemy always tries to come in in the beginning of a thing. In the beginning of a thing. That's when he tries to come in. Because he knows that if he can come in in the beginning of a, of a thing, he can change the whole makeup of it. You know, he can try to distort our minds. Yeah. He can try to distort, you know, the mind, the mindset so that we won't go into our destiny. First Samuel 8. And seven. Let's go to First Samuel eight and seven. And it reads, And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Yeah. Yeah. So Samuel, he's all upset, you know, and 
grieve with the people because when the people told them that they no longer wanted the, uh, him, him or his sons to be their judge, that they wanted a king like all the other nations, he took it personally. You know, so he's grieved by it. And he goes to God, and God has to let him know, like, look, it ain't really you that they're rejecting. It's me. They're rejecting their invisible king. Because up until this time, it was God that ruled the nation of Israel. All of all the other nations, they had their kings, but God ruled, and God ruled Israel, and he did it through the he did it through the judges. Through the prophets, the prophets were the one that spoke on behalf of God and helped to deliver God's people and helped the kingdom to be established. But the people got to the point where they was leaning to their own understanding because they were yeah. so worried about Samuel's sons not walking the way that they were supposed to walk. They decided out of their own minds and wisdom, look, we want another king. We want a king. This will be the first king. They said, we want a king. And so Israel had started crying out for a king to come to rule Israel. This grieved Samuel because up until this point, the prophets ruled and were the judges. Samuel thought they were rejecting him, but like I said, they were rejecting God. And so whenever rejected rejection comes, we already know. And, 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 and the worst rejection is when God rejects you. You Come know, it's one thing if on. man rejects you, but the worst thing that could ever happen is God rejecting yeah. you. Come on, speak You that. know, and so he tries to warn them. He tries to warn them through Samuel that, look, this ain't even my plan for you. This is, this is not the plans that I have, but I'll give you your heart's desire if that's what you want. He said, make sure, he told Samuel, make sure, in other words, paraphrasing, that they are aware of what they were asking for. Yeah. If you read the next couple of verses about how this king was going to come and it wasn't going to be the king that they think because they made a choice. And listen, it's sometimes it's our choices. Yeah. It's our choices that subject us come on. to stuff. Come on now. You know, so here they made the choice to have King Saul. And so God allowed them, to, he went ahead and honored their choice. Their choice would greatly alter their destiny. And that's what we see here. Their choice is altering their destiny. And because of it, they'll now be a nation that's ruled by somebody who eventually don't even, they don't, they don't have no fear of God. You know, it seems like he was just almost turned over to his own mind. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, we see him getting anointed by Samuel. You know, we even see where in scripture prophecy fell on him. I mean, God anointed him to be king. And then all of a sudden, because of his disobedience and rebellion, because wherever rejection is, there's going to be rebellion. Yeah. Rebellion causes him to lose out. In verse 9. It says, now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will, who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Amen. In verse 19, they responded after he gets done telling them how this king would tax them and, you know, how he would take his take their children and make them slaves. You know, he, 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 he warns them. He speaks as the voice of God, prophetically warning them what would happen. And then, then in verse 19, they basically say, nay, we still want a king. Yeah. We still want a king. Because of them rejecting God. Because of their rejecting God. And what I want us to see from that is rejection to take you to a place that you don't want to go. Yeah. Amen. Rejection will alter your life. It'll have you dealing with stuff that God never even wanted to subject you to. Yeah. And so this is why it's so important that we let rejection go. Yeah. Because you know what? If I as a parent don't let rejection go. Okay, that, that same seed that's inside of me, I pass down to my children. 
If I teach my child to hate their father, then all I'm doing is setting up rejection inside of them. Uh -huh. And when God came into my life, I became fully aware of that. That was the one thing that I never did. I never talked about or tried to talk against my ch my children's father to them. Yeah. Because I realized by me doing that, I was only going to pass hatred down to oh, them. That's good. You know, and I was going to pass rejection. The, thing, the same thing that I had to deal with, the same thing that tried to alter my life, I was going to pass it down to them. And I knew that wasn't God's plan. And this is why we got to let rejection go. We see this man who God wins. He sent Samuel to find him. When, they, when Israel decided that they wanted a king, Samuel went and found him for God. Amen. Anointed him and, and appointed him. You know, but the whole time, that was not God's desire. But he allowed it to take place. Yeah. There's some things that happened in our life that was not the plan of God. You know, but our choices, choices allow things to take place in our life. And this is why we got to let rejection go, because rejection causes us to make bad choices. It causes us to make bad choices. Rejection caused me to make a lot of bad choices growing up. You know, that was not the life that God had designed for me. I had a loving home. I had a mother that was doing the best she can. Was she perfect? No, none of us is perfect. I wasn't a perfect mother. But she was doing the best she can. And she was doing what God told her to do. And that was to lead me to God. But I made a choice because I refused to let rejection go. Because I was mad and upset because I felt somebody wasn't there for me like I wanted them to be. They didn't love me like I, like the definition says, like I wanted to be loved. So I began to make bad choices. I decided in ninth grade that I was going to drop out of school. I decided at 15 years old to run away from home, sleep in the streets, sleep in an abandoned uh, basement and, and um, bus stations. I decided that. I decided at 16 years old to become a drug dealer and start dealing drugs. I put my life in danger because I didn't want to let rejection go because I didn't realize that choosing not to forgive was, a, was saying, you know what, I'm going to allow rejection to remain inside of me. Because the requirement is to forgive. It's a requirement. And that's why God is bringing us back here on today. This is why he's got this teaching going on. Because some of us have tried to move on. We've tried to move forward. But we have not really forgave. And because we haven't forgiven, rejection is still sitting there waiting inside of us. And a lot of times it is sitting in a wait until your defining moment, just like King Saul. It could have attacked him a long time ago in his life, but he waited until he was appointed king in front of a whole nation for it to cause him to lose his mind. Yeah. And that's what rejection will do. Yeah. It is sitting in a lie doormat inside of you until your defining moment. And then here you are, up on stage, for the whole world to see a rejection attack you. Come on. But God's trying to break and destroy rejection at the root uh -huh. before we get to that point. Yeah. He's trying to stop it from destroying our destiny. So as time goes on with King Saul and in, in, in rulership, just as Samuel had prophesied to the people, Saul began to walk in rebellion. He told them that in the beginning. He told them the type of king that they would have. At first, it didn't look like it. You know, because like I said, that stuff, the enemy's plots, he's, he, he's, he, 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 where he, he knows just when to try to release a plot to destroy us. And he got that thing set up inside of us. It's set up in a lot of our wounds because we've been hurt, because of the things that we've had to go through and deal with in life. And now that rejection is set up inside in our womb, waiting for the opportunity to come. 
And because the enemy, he's not just after our life. He's after hundreds of lives. You know, so he'll wait. Let you go up, be used in ministry and everything. You know, and then all of a sudden, when you think that you are right, all of a sudden, something will get touched. Come on. You know that root that I was talking about. All of a sudden, somebody betrayed you, and, 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 and you thought you was over it. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, here comes rejection again, full-fledged. And we're wondering, where did it come from? It came because the root was always there. Yeah. Yeah. Because we think that people make us behave a certain way. No, nobody can make you behave a certain way. Nobody made Saul turn into the madman that he turned into. It was something inside of him, and it was, it was a reason why he became rebellious. He was rejected. Yeah. And like I say, it was worse than ever because he was rejected by God. Because God had told him how to walk in order to remain king. He told him how to walk. And we don't know this for a fact, but if you could go somewhere back down, probably his childhood, we probably would see where that rejection probably was hiding out yeah. all that time. Uh -huh. We don't know it to, to be a fact, but just the fact that when he became so rebellious after God had already warned him and told him that, look, if you want to be the king that I appoint, if you want to be the king that I anointed, then you're going to have to obey. But it was something inside of him that did not want to obey. That's the scary thing about rejection is that it will cause us to walk in disobedience. And the enemy knows that. Amen. He knows. You ain't gonna let us go to church for a while. Mm -hmm. You know? And then I think about when I, I watch different people when they come home out of the prison system and stuff. You know, and, and they're on fire and they're trying to go, you know, do the right thing and everything seems to be coming together. And then all of a sudden, here goes that old enemy, that rejection that's inside of them that nobody has dealt with is coming to the surface now. Uh -huh. yeah. And now all of a sudden, the fruit of rejection comes forth because they thought it was gone, but now all of a sudden, rebellion's back and I'm back in the prison system again. But God wants to deliver his Come people on. because it's not only the natural prison system that we keep going into, but we keep going into a spiritual Come prison on. Yeah. because we won't let rejection go. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this was the way with Saul. Saul was the first birthing of a king for Israel. Okay, so that, that was the first king. And like I said, the enemy always tries to get in at the beginning of a thing. Amen. You know, that's why we'll, 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 we'll God will give us a plan and, you know, we'll step forward in that plan to try to carry out what God is doing. And a lot of times we get discouraged because the enemy always tries to come in at the beginning of a yeah. thing. Because we're not aware of, of how he works sometimes. You know, or we forget how he works sometimes. And we think because things are going the way that it's going, that it can't be God. But no, the enemy's just doing his job. Hallelujah, because that's what he wants to do. He wants to try to destroy us before we get birth. Yeah. Amen. And that's where we're at right now. We're at a very crucial moment right now. It's no mistake that this teaching is coming forward. Because many of us are about to give birth. But before we give birth, God wants to go deep down inside of us. And he wants to pull that root of rejection out so that what we give birth to won't be destroyed. Come on, that's yeah. good. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read 1 Samuel 15 and 23. This is how serious rebellion is. And like I said, rebellion is one of the biggest fruits that's produced by rejection. I'm telling you, if we were just, as the more I study and the more that I see how many fruits, and I'm talking about evil fruits, hurt and betrayal and pride and, you know, suicide spirits and all of that stuff is all birth from rejection. It is at the root. So what is that telling me? That if I can just deal with the rejection that's inside of me, uh -huh. I can be free. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And it reads, For rebellion is as 
the sins of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. Rebellion is as the sins of witchcraft. Come on, that's good. That's why it can alter your life. Because that's what witchcraft does. It's, it's potions that alter people's lives. It alters their thinking. It alters their behavior. And so when rejection sets itself up inside of you and rebellion comes along, it alters our lives. Because it says it's the same as witchcraft. Now that's strong, that's deep, but it also should bring a lot of revelation to us so that we can recognize and realize what's going on. Not just what's going on with us, but what's going on with family members, what's going on with our children. And it should make us want to um, have a heart like God and say, you know what, i, I got to extend some forgiveness to this person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if forgiveness is what it takes for me to go into my destiny, then I need to go ahead and forgive. Uh -huh. I need to release it out to them. Uh -huh. So, but then we got again. We got to realize that the only thing, and I'm just, I just want to slow it down. I'm just trying to find my, my place in the vein of God. Come on, that's good. The only thing that they were guilty of, in most cases. Is not having the wisdom and knowledge of the truth of God's word. We've been given the wisdom and knowledge of the truth of God's word out today. So we've been given the opportunity that many did not have. You know, when you began to realize that people dealt with you based upon the hand they was dealt. It gives you that ability to forgive and to love. And the main thing is it gives you the ability to be able to move on in life. You know, just to think that the enemy, if I would have allowed him, would have killed me out there in the streets. Wow. He could have destroyed me out there in those streets. And see, this is why I even want to talk to the young people, even at a very young age, I want to talk to you right now and tell you that if it's somebody that hurts you, you go ahead and release them, yeah. forgive them, because you got your whole destiny at stake. You got your whole life at stake. And if you allowing yourself to not forgive someone, it's like you staying chained to them. Yeah. When you're, when you're playing the thoughts in your mind over and over about how you've been hurt by that person, how they treated you, you are chained to that person. And God don't want to want us chained to, to no one that hurt us. He wants us released yes. and then free. You know, all the songs out tonight talked about freedom. God wants us to have that spiritual freedom. He wants us to allow Him to heal every layer of our hurt. He wants to release us from the roots of rejection. In verse 24, it says, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So he chose the people over God. Come on. He chose the people over God. And that caused him to go down this road. Like I said, the choice he made. He might not have known when he was making that choice that he was going to end up having a murdering spirit come upon him. Whoa. You know, sometimes when you make choices, you don't realize all the consequences of your choices. Yeah. You know, and so yes, there were people who we may feel we're a victim of, but sometimes when people make choices, they don't realize the consequences of their choices. I don't know if he's sincere in this moment or not when he says that, you know, that to forgive him. I don't know whether he's sincere or not. Again, I'm going to read it. It said, and Saul said unto Samuel, I have 
sin, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. In verse 25, it says, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And then in verse 26, is Samuel's response. And it says, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected thee from being king over Israel. It was too late. It was too late. By that point, he didn't even know that he had been replaced. God had found another king. Come on. Come on. And we're at that time right now. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about me. You know, that's one thing about me. I don't mind being transparent. That's right. I don't mind. You know, and I know I'm at that place where anything I need to let go of, anything I need to release, I need to go ahead and do it. Because yeah. I don't want to end up like Saul. Even if Saul was sincere, it was too late. He had already been replaced. And his replacement, it drove him almost crazy to realize that he's been replaced. We're at a crucial point in time right now. God desires to use, I know for a fact, everybody in here. How he wants to use us is all different. But he's brought each and every one of us here on tonight. It's no mistake that we're brought to the point where he's saying, let me deal with the rejection. When God first started really, really, really dealing with me with rejection, at first, you know, when I first came to God, certain things, like I said, we want to deal with stuff at surface level. Okay? Certain things about me I started dealing with. You know, people used to be like, oh, you look so mean. Da, 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 da. So I tried to get the smile on my face and all that stuff. You know, the stuff everybody would see. And um, I was very, very antisocial. Very antisocial. Didn't really want to speak to nobody. I mean, church would end. My pastor would make a joke. He'd be like, you go with the wind after church. Because I, I didn't want nobody to try to get to know me. I just said, you know what, I'm coming to church, that's it. I don't want nothing to do with nobody else. And then after God started, you, you know, working with me and stuff, he, that, that type of stuff, I, I started working with him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm, even now, I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I know it might be hard to believe that, but I, I really am. I'm really an introvert. You know, but I do a lot better now, I hope, right? Amen. Okay, all right, yeah. So, you know, it was easy for me to deal with that part, but it was that stuff that y'all couldn't see. You know, the stuff that I felt, I, didn't, I wasn't causing any harm, that this was the harm that was done to me. And so I kept going with it and going with it, and you know, I always could see that it was somebody else's fault, you know, that's how the enemy does. I really felt like a victim. Yeah. You know, that, that victim mentality, yeah. that's the trick of the enemy. Come on, that's right. God wants to release us from the victim mentality. Right. Come on. He'll, we'll, we'll never go into our destiny with a victim mentality. Oh, See, I, I had a victim mentality for a while. I was like, well, you know what? I'm a single parent. I'm, you know, I'm raising my girls by my own, by myself. Don't nobody know what I'm going through. Can't nobody say nothing to me about nothing. Because they don't, you know, that victim mentality. That victim mentality was going to keep me right in that place. And then one day, all of a sudden, God began to deal with me and stuff. And next thing I know, with that, that, that victim mentality, it went away. And so I said, you know what? I, I'm a single mother, but it ain't nothing that I can't do through Christ Jesus who's yeah, trained yeah, me. Yeah. And then, because uh, that, was just, that was the easy stuff that God wanted to deal with. At the same time, uh, as time goes on, I'm, you know, he's, he's working on me. He's allowing me to move forward. But there was some stuff on the inside, deep down, where nobody, that nobody could see that he wanted to deal with. You know, in the meantime, I'm thinking I'm all right. 
Because first, I'm, I'm the, at first I was just cleaning the bathroom at the church, but I was happy to be cleaning the bathrooms at the church. Yeah. Then I became an usher. Then I became a Sunday school teacher. Then I, I got licensed as a minister, became a youth minister. I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'm all right with God, you know. And nobody else really sees what's going on down in the inside, so, you know, maybe God all right with me. And then all of a sudden, time goes on, I get ordained the elder, and I start to hear God say, all right, now, it's time for you to start dealing with that stuff that you ain't been dealing with, that stuff you blocked out, and the stuff that you, you know, you don't want to deal with. It's time for you to start dealing with it. And so... I kept on avoiding it. I deal with it a little bit, stop. I deal with it a little bit, stop. And then next thing I know, God said, you know what? Sit down. Because I don't even want you to go no further. I can't use you like that until you let it go. And so I'm coming tonight not to try to push anybody to do anything or, or try to push people to the altar. That's not it. I'm coming tonight and I made myself an example. I made myself transparent because I know that God wants us delivered from rebellion, from rejection, from the hurt, from the shame. He wants us delivered from that. And so that's all I really wanted to talk about on tonight is I just wanted us to have a good understanding of that womb, that fight that the enemy has been taken and that it been, been the, that the fight that's been going on since in the garden against the womb. You know, so with that being said, if it's anybody at this time, 